Okay, well thank you again everyone for coming out. This is an amazing turnout and thank you to all the um, co-sponsors that I listed in the beginning. Um, I wanted to just uh, get started quickly with the panel so we have as, as long a time to discuss um, as possible. Um, I wanted to say thank you to these amazing speakers that are up here that I'm about to introduce for being a part of this. Um, I wanted to thank Leonard C. Jefferson, whose artwork appears throughout the movie. Um, I definitely couldn't have made such an amazing uh, movie without his, um, his impact. And he just released a book of his poems and drawings that I have for sale outside, so you should definitely check that out. Um, I wanted to thank uh, my dad and my wife Karen, um, who were very supportive in this whole process, the International Socialist Organization for supporting and helping put this together, organize this, um, as well as all the co-sponsoring organizations. So with that, let me um, introduce our speakers, and uh, I've told them to keep it to uh, three or four minutes, and I'm going to keep you to that just so that we can go back and forth as much as possible. And I think there's going to be some microphones for the audience um, at some point. I wonder if I could have two members of Decarcerate PA that could volunteer to walk the uh, mics around to people. Um, so when that happens, um, he's going to Austin's going to get them for us. So uh, let me start. I'll go down at the end. So let me introduce Amir Varek Ama, who actually came the farthest. He came from New York City because I wanted this to be more than just about Philadelphia, and they're doing some great organizing there in New York City that he's going to talk about. Um, he was in uh, he was incarcerated for two decades under New York's Rockefeller drug laws and he is now a student and an activist, and he works with the campaign to end the new Jim Crow. And so, Amir, let me, let me pass it off to you to, for your uh, three minutes, okay? Thank you. Hello, how are you doing? Um, this one is Amir Ama. Um, I was incarcerated at age 21 for a crime I didn't commit. Um, the Rockefeller Drug Lords was actually the most uh, harshest drug laws that's in the country. Um, when they say a DA can incarcerate you or can indict a ham sandwich, believe it. Um, the only reason why that right now that I am out and able to share my story is because the economy is on the crunch. The prison system has drawn so much resources from us, it's ridiculous. As the young brother in the picture said that so much resources is going to wars and everything else, but not to our actual community. So upon release, I joined um, the campaign to um, end the new Jim Crow. And you know, we're trying to do a lot of things out there. Hopefully I'll be able to share some more with you. Thank you for having me. Thanks. I want to next introduce Hakeem Ali, who works, uh, he was incarcerated himself throughout his life, starting at, I believe, age 14. Um, and he is an activist a coordinator with uh, Reconstruction Inc. and an activist with Decarcerate PA. So, Hakeem, thanks for being here. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you, uh, Matt, for allowing all of us this opportunity not only to view the film but to share uh, our life stories and experiences with this audience. Uh, Matt was correct in terms of my first incarceration occurred when I was 14. Uh, and unfortunately, it wasn't my last. Uh, this time around, uh, inshallah, it will be my last. Uh, I came home in 2003 after serving almost 40 years in state and federal institutions. Uh, shipped throughout the country. Uh, experienced some of the most devastating things you could possibly experience. Uh, to me personally and what I witnessed, uh, in the uh, prison system of this country. Uh, you can say I got a PhD in terms of incarceration, uh, not necessarily from the university, but from the University of Hard Knocks of Incarceration. Uh, I am involved with uh, two organizations that Matt, uh, that Matt mentioned, Reconstruction Incorporated, uh, which is a program that's uh, really uh, working towards trying to deal with men, women, and children who are both inside and, in fact, coming home, and the families of those people, which is a key thing. 
And uh, I'm also uh, intimately involved with Decarcerate PA. And as I speak more today, I'm going to share some very important things about that, including a major, major activity that we're planning for Monday the 19th. I'm definitely going to tell you about that. Thank you very much. Next, we have Joshua Glenn. Um, Josh uh, was arrested um, when he was 16 and charged as an adult, um, which has a whole different aspect to this, um, the way we treat our youth in criminal justice. Um, now he's an organizer with YASP, uh, Youth Arts and Self-Empowerment. So thank you, Josh, for being here. Uh, I'm Josh, and I work with the Youth Arts and Empowerment Project. We're a youth-led organization that work with young people that are charged as adults, and we employ young people part-time as youth organizers and uh, upon release. So we go into the Philadelphia Adult Judge, we do art and poetry workshop every weekend, and then we try to train young people about the system, about structural violence, the school prison pipeline, so they can know about those things. And then we uh, basically, uh, we use peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and show them how to be leaders, and upon release, we employ them as youth organizers. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Next, we have Crystal Pohl, um, who is a, a high school student, and she's very active. It's pretty impressive to see what a high school student can do and get around. Um, she works with Youth United for Change um, and is also a youth advocate for the Juvenile Law Center. So thank you, Crystal, for being here. Um, I'm involved with Juvenile Law Center's Do Nots for Justice. Do Nots for Justice is uh, one of Juvenile Law Center's two advocacy, ad, advocacy programs. Uh, one is for youth in the child welfare system, and this is for youth who have been in the juvenile justice system. Um, Do Nots for Justice is an organization of youth who have had experience or are currently involved in the system and want to bring change to that system. Um, so I've been involved with Do Nots for Justice for two years. This is this is my second year. The first year, working with um, Juveniles for Justice, we chose on, we, our project, our campaign that we chose was promote an effective case planning. The reason we chose to promote effective case planning was because we felt like, you know, after sharing our personal experiences with each other um, and trying to figure out, you know, what was wrong with the system, we felt like when you enter the system, their life isn't any better when they leave the system. And this was an issue because it didn't meet one of the goals of the juvenile justice system, which is supposed to be to rehabilitate youth. And um, we felt like this was a huge issue, so we, ch we chose to focus on promoting effective case planning. Um, this year, our project is um, educating youth on their rights. Um, as I was watching the video, it was sad to see what was going on in the criminal justice system. I'm not really educated on a lot that's you know going on within that system since I'm a, since I was a juvenile and I'm focused on the juvenile justice system. But it's crazy to see that um, what's happening there. I feel like how the juvenile justice system is set up now, it's only leading you to the adult system. Um, one of the things I, I, that came to me is watching the video. I couldn't understand why. The titles of these systems include justice when justice is not being met. I feel like when um, you think about when you think about the victims, um, you think about the person um, that didn't commit the crime, but a crime was committed against that criminal, um, and no one was held accountable for it. And I feel like uh, people need to wake up and pay attention that you know it doesn't just start in court. It doesn't start or it doesn't end after. Um, and it needs to begin before. Uh, something that happened in the video was someone said that, uh, I forgot his name, but he was explaining the procedure to getting arrested. And I was arrested. And it was sad to see that what happens in the adult system also happens in the juvenile justice system. Um, when I first got arrested, I had to go through some, a, a similar procedure. Uh, which was being stripped down, being checked. I had to cough to make sure you know nothing fell out of my private area. My hair had to be checked, um, and I feel like that's ridiculous that these two systems are so similar. Um, and working with Juveniles for Justice, um, I feel like I have an opportunity to you know change the system, and that's what I plan to do. Uh, 
And uh, lastly, to my left, we have uh, Dana Lomax Williams, who um, was incarcerated in Pennsylvania prisons, was tortured in solitary confinement there, and she uh, just rejoined us about six months ago that she's been out, and she's become very active, and she's joined forces with the Human Rights Coalition here in Philadelphia, and so she's trying to get active on this issue, and I welcome you, Dana, to the panel. First, I'd like to congratulate you and to thank you. Um, like Brother Hakeem said, it is an honor, and I thank you. Um, yes, I was at Muncie for supposed to be almost a year, which turned, which turned into four years. Why? So glad you asked, because I, first of all, I have a big mouth, and I was always one to never just go for whatever you say. However, in that type of setting, you have rules that you have to abide by. Okay, fine. Um, and I began to speak out about certain issues, exposing certain things. Okay, so I felt like I was in here already, and what else did I have to lose? But what really compelled me is meeting certain women and finding out certain things that they go through and they're not able to express how they feel due to retaliation. Okay, I felt like I'm going home. Okay, but what about my sisters and my brothers who can't go home? What about those who don't have family members to support them and speak out for them? So what I did was a person put me in connect with HRC Human Rights Coalition. I wrote them. And it took them some time to write me back because they need, we need volunteers. All this is volunteer work. You know, I can't express to you how imperative it is for family members and friends or if you have a, no, have a loved one or know of a loved one or like Teresa Schultz said, or just are willing to just dedicate and commit some time to helping us respond to these inmates. Um, nevertheless, I contacted them. Amanda Johnson wrote me back, and I was like, yes. He was like, look, I hear you. I'm talking about it. I'm going to make sure we uh, see some information as to how you can rectify these issues. Nevertheless, um, but when you're in there, it's a whole world within itself. Everybody's connected, either related, dated each other, went to school together, had some type of connection. So you're doomed if you do, you're doomed if you don't. However, um, by going through what I went through, it compelled me to speak out. So I started in there, actually. And I said, when I get out, however I could be of service, I'm going to be of service because I don't understand how anybody could go through that and not be compelled to do something to make a difference. So I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a difference. And that's why I'm here. I'm representing HRC. I love Human Rights Coalition and all the other organizations that is committed to being an advocate for those inmates and their families. Wow, so that's the first time I've ever heard people keep under the time that I give them, so that was pretty impressive. <laughs> So let me just say a couple things um, about myself and what I think my role can be on this panel. Um, my name is Matt Pillisher. I've been an activist for about 10 years. Um, I'm an attorney, and I have been involved with work around the criminal justice system um, throughout law school and in, as my first year as an attorney, which was last year. Um, I started making this film in law school, and it was really a perfect combination. I've, been, I've made films before, I'm an artist too, so this was a combination of all my passions. And I saw that this is an issue that the law can't quite fix, and that a social movement needs to fix. And, but there's a lot of misinformation out there, so how do you get people um, you know, to get active? They need the right information, so I thought a film was the perfect um, solution to that, and this is what I'm trying to do. Tonight is an example of the things I've been doing across the country, doing these screenings and discussions for the last nine months with this movie. Um, but also in my role, I'm a part of the International Socialist Organization, and I see a lot of these problems of criminal justice tied to our era of global capitalism and a, and a system that puts profit before people. And so I think with so many experts uh, that have been inside, outside the system, I'm not gonna speak as much to that, I'm gonna let the panel speak, but I will give some of my views um, as a socialist and the connections I see to capitalism and you know the kind of things we need to fight back to win systemic reforms um, to, to change criminal justice. So with that, let me open it up to um, the audience. Do we have a couple of microphones? Great. Um, so please uh, raise your hand and you'll get a mic come to you. I'm also going to keep you all to uh, a reasonable amount of time, so don't take it personal if I tell you to wrap up. 
Hi. Uh, thanks for showing the movie. I'm very concerned about the topic. I don't know. Can you put the mic in front of your mouth? Sorry. Thanks for showing the movie. Uh, I hope you'll be doing it again in other areas so it can be well known that more people can join what you're doing to do something about it. Because I think with the prison system, they make it a business and you're using it. There are some people that should be there, there's some people that should not, but I think they're using it as a business. Why don't we do a, we'll do two or three people at once and then we'll come back to the panel for comments, okay? Hi, um, I really appreciate the work that you're doing and um, from my personal experience working with private prisons, I was privileged to have a program for literacy for women within 12 months of release. But in my investigation, I discovered that everybody who is incarcerated, there's a bond taken out on them. Do you know that to be true? And if not, can we talk later about that? There's a bond that's actually issued on every life. So your one year can turn into four years depending on how it's invested. So I want to know if anybody at that panel or within this audience can speak to that topic. One more, uh, one more question or comment if there is one. Uh, thank you so very much. On a political front, when associated with incarceration. When politicians run for office, they, I'll use the word all, as far as Democrat versus Repub and Republican, not the Independent or the Green Party. But when the major parties run for office, they all have to get endorsed by law enforcement in order to win the campaign. So, how can these chains, these bonds be broken? And I do, I did hear Ms. Alexander doing a movie say how this has to be a social movement, and I totally agree. At the same time, it also has to be a political movement. So how can a new politician win office without being endorsed by the enemy, the, the incarceration, the, 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 the law enforcement, Hold. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I can speak on the monetary part at first. Uh, as the sister said, I don't know how individuals can go through the system and not come out and actually do something about it. I was tortured for over eight hours because the system, the police just wanted me to tell on somebody who actually was in the game. I couldn't walk or eat for over six months. So I was really, really hurtful. I made a promise, if I had to do 25 to life, I was gonna come home and kill 25 cops. No if, buts, ands about it. But if it wasn't for um, individuals who was inside, who've been incarcerated since the 60s during the Black Power Movement, if anybody know about a book called COINTELPRO, mm -hmm. those individuals snatched me up and out of the 20 years, I was able to do 18 years of actually studying. In the last seven years was just done on concentrating on social actions or social issues. When I came home and I did the studies and I found out how much money they spent on me being incarcerated for a nonviolent offense, it was almost one million dollars. In New York City or New York State, at the time of the height of the so-called drug war, there was over 72,000 individuals incarcerated. Most of them come from the seven little neighborhoods in New York City. So out of that 72,000, over 85% was black and Hispanic, and out of that, over that 85%, of over that, the total number, 85% was from New York City, so that was over 50,000 people just coming from New York City that was incarcerated. Now with that $1 million, I could've went to Oxford, when they got a degree, come back, start a small business, hire seven people, get a house, put 200,000 in the bank, and still get a state over 200,000. That's one person. Now, times that th times the 30,000 that was in there for a nonviolent offense. Now, times that across the nation are the hundreds of millions, you know, the millions we have inside. So, and to add on, yes, there is a bond for prisons on Wall Street. It's not only core crab, uh, there's some specifics with Bush and things in it, but there's so many entities that prison um, associates with. It's an upstate rural area that's really disenfranchised, just the same as they have in the inner city that's disenfranchised. 
That prison not only bring, if, like in New York, there's one prison, there's a thousand prisoners. There's 750 officers, 350 civilians, not including all the buses and everything that goes to that prison and all the hotels that surround it in that community. So it's going to have to take a lot of social movement and especially we need to get our own elected officials inside. We have to have, tell the elected officials, listen, if you vote one more thing to increase a war and increase something else without increasing the social issues, you out of here because there's no sense. And the same thing, we have to bring this to the Republicans and those in the inner city, I mean, in the rural areas, because they're not happy too. You know, they just want to be officers. It's, it's proven fact that in the height of the economic crunch in the United States in 2009, 2010, when everybody was in a decline, Raleigh, North Carolina, and Austin, Texas still had some economic growth, and that's because the economy was based on education and technology. So if these two areas can do it, and the whole nation is still messed up, but these two areas is like not common sense. Let's take our resources and put it back into the community. That's what we have to do. I want to piggyback off of what your brother said. Okay, what the young lady said, as far as the bond, absolutely. And not only when you get in there is bond, but if you're if you're sentenced to your prescription plan says that you have to do a specific program, a therapeutic community program where there is no licensed psychologist, so how can you therapize me on anything, okay? So they get an X amount of money from the state, a stipend, okay? So what they do is they recycle those people. They kick you out like they did me for giving somebody to eat. Are you serious? So they kick me out, make me wait an additional two years to get back in, so while I'm rotating, they had hundreds of other people rotating and they get money for each person that's in that program. So it's basically a, a, a money-making, as we all know, business, exactly, a money-making business and industry. Yes, we are buying, yes. Okay. Uh, terminology that I'm sure the majority of the people in this room know, prison industrial complex, okay? Industrial complex, industrial implies money-making machine. That's all I'm saying that both of these uh, People spoke to the bond issue, uh, the financial issue. But what I want to address was the point that the young man asked in regards to how do we deal with this issue of incarceration, of prison building, etc., if we don't get involved with, and I think he said, uh, the enemy. <laughs> and I'm assuming that the enemy means the, the political arena and the electoral process. That is a part of what we have to do. Okay, absolutely have to do. But that's not the all and be all of what needs to be done. Michelle Alexander in the film and the young man that was with the students continue to speaking about we need a movement. Probably right in this room, just looking at the people here, there's about maybe 10 to 15 different organizations in this room representing I don't know how many different people that's a part of a member of your organization in this room. What the hell is going on that we can't unite and create that movement that's needed to deal with these issues? Yeah. One of the groups that I'm a part of, the Carcerate PA, has been in the street, marching like we saw in that film, has challenged the governor of this fair state of Pennsylvania, has been into debates with John Whistle, who is the Secretary of the Department of Corrections, has been out there, and we all need to be out there. And I'm gonna take this opportunity to plug Monday. At four o'clock on Monday, the 19th of this month, we're gonna put John Whistle and Governor Corbin on trial for crimes against the citizens of Philadelphia. This is gonna take place, this is gonna take place at the municipal building at their house. It would take place in City Hall, but you see they done tore up the joint so we can't get there, <laughs> all right? We're telling you to come out. We have our own judge that's gonna be presiding. We have our own representative of the people. We ain't gonna call her a prosecutor because we down with, the hell with prosecuting. You have to represent the people. The courtrooms are supposed to represent the people. But what they do is they represent a segment of the people, those who are in power. We're going to change that. You're going to hear charges 
So Sudanians are going to be there talking about some specific things that took place in Muncie. Charges against them dudes. How they took money, took money from education in order to build prisons. And the council has established three platforms. First and foremost, we're saying stop building prisons in the state of Pennsylvania. That's number one. We don't need no more prisons. Number two is the name itself, decarcerate. What that means is to let people out of the prison, decarcerate. We know what incarcerate means, right? So we want to decarcerate. And lastly, we want to reinvest the money into the community where all your organizations can get access to it and we can build a movement. This thing can be done, you know. We have to believe it can be done. And we have to act together in unity. That's it. Let's go back to the audience. Can we get uh, two or three more people? Questions, comments? Um, my name is Abdul Sabor. I'm the father of Askia Sabor. Oh, wow. September the 3rd, two years ago, he was beat up by 19th District Police Officer, Leah Cal. Uh, we go to court on the 28th of this month to see that those charges are dropped and he's released from Montgomery County where they did a racial profile. They came across City Avenue and locked my son up. They didn't have a due process like they normally don't give to us. And this uh, film that you showed, that you showed um, it touched me all kinds of ways. And it's just like you said, we need a movement. And you're right, brother, in regards to being out there come this Monday. And if God's willing, I'll be out there with you all. Because uh, my son would want me to be out there with you all. And I really, I'm really angry as hell. You know, and just being angry and emotional is not going to solve the problem. We got to find the facts and the issues, and we got to bring them forth to a body of people that's willing to move out. The Askia Coalition is willing to move out. You have a couple of us here now, but hopefully we all will be out coming to see you Monday. Uh, I don't have any uh, thing to say. Other than that, I need your support come the, uh, the 28th of this month at uh, CJC uh, 702, um, and that's the room number where the judge will be uh, residing over the case. And uh, uh, I, I, I need to see as many people as I possibly can see, you know, come this time. So many people that they'll say we have to close the door. Mm -hmm. We have to shut the illegal system down. And the only way we can shut them down is that we stand up and do what we have to do. Because right. just being a father should be enough. When you was coming up, like myself, they would take you home mm -hmm. to your parent. Mm -hmm. They don't do that anymore. They kill you right in the street. So I, I, I don't want to scare anybody, alarm anybody, mm -hmm. but your lives are in peril. Leaving here, going down the street because some stupid cop want to do something to you because he got a badge and a gun. This is what's going on. Right. You know, I, I mean, you got to see it for what it is. And it doesn't matter what you are. White, black, or candy stripe, it don't make no difference. They want to kill you because they feel as though that's their job. One of the uh, guards that- Can you wrap up, Optimus? I'm wrapping up. Thank you. One of the guards that was on the uh, uh, the uh, screen there, he was talking about how crazy the stuff is and what they expect people to do because he thought that they was no good, the criminal was no good, or the convict was no good, but he was uh, doing his job. But we need to get rid of him and the rest of those daggone people and uh, not have this kind of thing going on. Thank you. There was the...
Criminal Justice Center at 13th and Philbert, 702, 9 o'clock. Anyone, anyone could go in the Criminal Justice Center. It's theoretically ours. That's right. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I like to, first, good evening to everybody. Uh, and I applaud the, uh, audio, uh, the panel. Um, I think the real problem in America is that America has, had, has never had a, a real and honest conversation about race. And I think that's the root of what we're talking about. Also think that the gentleman said that we need a movement. We have a movement. It's called the 99%. And they have been across, they've been everywhere across the country. Um, we have that movement. The, pro the problem is. Let's try without the mic. We here. You go ahead, man. All right. The problem is the governing body of this nation needs to change in terms of composition, and so this body looks more like the people they govern. Nothing will change. That's a real change. So that's what we need to do. Uh, the governing body of this nation are predominantly white men. Nothing against white men. I thought all of you, especially those of you who are here, because what that says to me is you don't believe in white supremacy. You believe in fairness and equality, true equality. So let's change the composition of the, the governing body of this nation, and then everything will change. That's why. I Thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Robinson. Uh, I'm a member of the City Committee of the Green Party of Philadelphia. And I think that we should include in building our movement that it also have an electoral wing to it. Uh, the Green Party always runs candidates that are against mass incarceration. And we have another demand, which is end the school to prison pipeline. I didn't hear any mention of that uh, so far from the panel, but in terms of people who are interested in the young folks, uh, what's happening to them in high school now is really bad, especially in the urban areas. Uh, 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 the uh, trial of uh, Governor Corbett is a good idea, but the real trial of Governor Corbett happens in November of 2014 when he runs for re-election. <laughs> We want to run somebody against Corbin, so step forward if you're interested. <laughs> I think in the interest of time, we should just have a, a few more um, questions and then sort of a last round from, from our panelists. There's a couple people over here. I don't know if this is the right yeah. Hello. Um, my name is Leandra, and I've been working with um, inner city youth in North and South Philadelphia for the oh, there you go. For the last two years. And my question to um, most of the young people on the panel, but anyone else wanting to answer, is um, how can we reach, reach the middle and high school age kids that are targets for this prison pipeline and have um, as passionate about this um, issue as all of us in this room are? Because I, I know if um, inner city youth, especially in North Philadelphia, I find it difficult for me to reach them and let them know that they're targets for this pipeline and they need to focus on education and stuff like that. And from the two young people, how, what are some strategies that you can give people working with kids um, to let them know that they should focus on education and not trying to find and stuff like that? Before the next person, I'm just going to say, uh, I'm going to send um, Sarah and Henry up and down the aisles uh, for donations. In case you didn't notice, this was a free event and it did cost a lot of money to put on. 
wherever I do this, I make it a free event because I think it's important. Um, but I'm doing this all on my own. I'm the only person organizing all this, and I would love if you all, you know, can please dig deep and give whatever you can. Some of you can give more than others. And it's also about spreading the word. So if you can't give, maybe you know an organization that would be willing to help out with a grant, things like that. Maybe you know of a position that I could take on where I could continue doing this kind of work. Um, but it is something that I need to have money to be able to travel around the country and do, and it really is starting to make a difference as far as people getting a political framework for understanding how to fight back, making connections where there are 20 different organizations in a room talking to each other at the same time and figuring out what the next steps forward are. So please um, think about donating now, donating in the future. Help me out with connections if you can. You can connect to me through brokenonallsides.com. And thank you again very much. Let's see if there's uh, yeah. another uh, question or comment. Yeah, I, I just had a, a was listening to uh, Hakeem Ali when he was saying that, you know, why can't we get together as a uh, folks that have all these different organizations work together? And that seems to be the key. If you have a, a organization that's doing social justice in Philadelphia, you need to have some of the informed experts. And the informed experts are the ones sitting on the stage and other folks that have been on the other side of the wall, the folks that don't have the PhDs and the bachelor's degrees, but the folks that have been there, because they have the answers to how we can develop a strategy, a solution-based strategy. So please, you know, folks that are trying to do this work, put the folks in, uh, at the table that have been incarcerated to help develop that strategy or you'll find that you'll continue to do the work in Philadelphia that doesn't go anywhere. The other thing is prison industrial complex, I hear a lot, it's, it's really a uh, prison plantation industry. And I think Michelle Alexander made it real clear, you know, the, the plantation, I see that we're going to be at uh, Mass's house, the municipal building, and we really have to make a, a statement. You know, um, one thing that for the law enforcement that are in the room, if you know someone, a, a colleague that's abusing folk, that's taking advantage of folk, uh, that's going to folks' houses with these search warrants, you bring the red box in with the evidence, and you walk out, uh, i just like to say thank you, thank you, you know, very fucking much. <laughs> You know, deal with your colleagues. You have to deal with your colleagues. You, you're in the room, you know, you hear these issues that are going on, you hear your colleagues talking about shaking someone down. Mm -hmm. This has to be a systemic, you know, solution. It can't be us on the outside fighting, you know, City Hall all the time. It has to be the folks that are in positions of power. So you have to deal with your colleagues. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we should uh, go around to the, to the panelists because we're running out of time. We have to be out of this room by uh, six. I want to have some people, time for people to talk to the tables outside, the different organizations that are participating. So I'm sorry we're going to cut it off there. And if we can have the panel members maybe respond down the line if you want to start, Amir, and we'll uh, have our final comments. Hello. They had the new, um, the new Jim Crow. We have a website called thenewshimcrow.org and we actually have four um, main things that we're concentrating on and one of them is the school to prison pipeline. Um, what we do on our website, any organizations that have any actions, they can put it on our website and we will give an e-blast out. So that's one thing that I think Philly can do to every other community and every disenfranchised thing we can do to share the resources and to share what events going on. Second thing that we're doing out in New York, we are actually filling the courtrooms up with people. Uh, the stop and frisk, I know you know about that, it's the same thing that's happening here. We're challenging the system, we're challenging the judge, because when everybody's indicting the papers, it says the people of the state of such and such. So if the people come out and support for the person there, the judge has, he, he, he's in a dilemma now. Mm -hmm. Next thing we're trying to also do, we're trying to get what people doing the voting. We gotta know what these judges stand for. Because you would just have Obama, Republican, but as you go down, the judges is not, you know, what they stand for in society. So we have to definitely hit the electoral process. And for the brother was talking about the police, one thing that's hurting society to talk in the totality is peer pressure. 
There's prayer pressure in our communities. There's prayer pressure in every institution. A lot of things of racism, a lot of people just don't know is because they never had a chance to talk to people. A lot of times they look at somebody who's different than them and and when you start talking to them, you have the same likes and things, things like that. There's one other issue that I would like everybody that was related with the prison system is this is a study called the Stanford Prison Study. And this shows how when individuals get into law enforcement, they get a totally different attitude. This could be my uncle right here, but once I'm in law enforcement, I'm going to lock him up because I'm law enforcement right now. And they show how deep this is. The Stanford, and they did this in Stanford, Connecticut, a nice school. And the school did a study, and they made a mock surf prison. They made the quietest person the CEO, and then they switched it all around. So when they started studying, that quiet guy that didn't talk to nobody, he turned into something real special. <laughs> I, I mean, he was special. Then it got so worked so bad that the ward, I mean, that the, the, the professor that started the study actually started thinking he was a warden. His constituents was like, yep, hey. And you're not a warden, man. And he was like, but those are my guys. You're not a warden. So if this study happened back in the 1970s, I believe. A picture, a picture how it goes today. You know, I could be ask that social question. How many here have somebody incarcerated? Raise your hand. Nobody? Only a few? All right. If you don't have it, it affects you one way or another. It affects you with our taxes. It affects you with resources. And definitely, we have to get people inside the media and create our own media. So this is why I just ask everybody, you know, group together here at the campaign and the New Jim Crow. We have a, um, after we were based with Michelle Alexander's book. And we also have free study guides too. So what we do around New York, we first encourage everybody to start their own study groups. Learn the issue first. So when somebody says, well, this person did a crime, they should belong to people in prison, you can tell them like, yes, well, crime is up now, but when resources went to the community, crime went down. So you can simultaneously see when resources was taken out of the community, crime went up. So if you put it back, crime can go right back down. It's not, you know, rocket scientists. <laughs> I just ask everybody to get involved in all levels of government because we have to, you know, as somebody said, when the government starts representing with people who look like us, for us, by us, then this is a step in the right direction. Peace and blessings. Uh, once again, I want to thank uh, everyone that came out and met uh, for this opportunity. Uh, a couple of things that I want to raise uh, from people's comments and questions. First and foremost, uh, we have to be about it and not just talk about it. Uh, it's important that that distinction is done. Anyone can get up here on the stage and say the kind of stuff that you're hearing or be out in the street or go to the TV and rap. Okay, that's the easiest thing in the world to do is to talk. But you have to be about the work. That's what really makes a change in terms of what we're talking about addressing tonight and what we've been talking about over the years. Uh, the organization that I represent, Reconstruction Incorporated, is making an effort to do that, which is just one example. Other people here are probably doing the same thing. But one of the ways that they're doing it is that Reconstruction Incorporated has a 501c3, and I'm going to talk a, a minute about that. But what that does, it gives an opportunity for us to sponsor other organizations that's trying to get themselves together, that's trying to address the issues that can't get the funding. So Reconstruction allows their number to be given to that organization and they can apply for grants or funds or whatever the case may be so they can function. That's a small level of showing how you can work together with other organizations. One of the reasons that Reconstruction got involved with decarcerate is because this issue of decarcerating Pennsylvania is one of the more important issues on the face of this earth. It's the thing that's happening in the state of Pennsylvania, but it's happening all over America. And you have to start somewhere. You have to get involved somewhere. Why not here? Why not now? When you have one group that's willing to take the forefront in this fight, why not join? Uh, the brother that was talking about his son is uh, 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 scared. Yeah, I lost my, can't rap no more. I'm uh, scared that the police beat up. You know, you don't have to know him to be in the courtroom to support him. Okay? 
I, I pray that this same amount of people that's in this room tonight at this event would be in that courtroom when a real live situation is happening. This is an event that we're talking about issues. That courtroom on the 28th is a life death situation that should be equally important to you. That's how you deal with the movement, my man. We have to have officials, elected officials, in position so that changes can be made through the law and through the electoral process. We don't need no electoral officials to go out on the street and let everybody hear there's a problem here. And we have some recommendations about how to resolve the problem. That's what decarcerate those students you saw in the film, Occupy Philly. That's the way it was done in the 60s with the Civil Rights Movement. And who the heck says we can't do that again in the years 2000? Why? Why can't we do it? Is anybody stopping for real? Is somebody standing at our door with a gun saying, you better not go out there in the street and demonstrate? No. What changes our mentality? We stop believing that that could work. So we don't do it no more. We have to go back to what we know worked. My man, Thomas Ford stood up, and I'm gonna be quiet right after this. I see you jumping out to see man. <laughs> uh, Thomas Ford stood up and said, you need the people at the table who has experienced this, who has knowledge about this. And he's absolutely right. Who better than a person like myself that did over 40 years in incarceration can speak to how you change that? Who better than this young man, who's still a young man, but unfortunately spent all them years in the penitentiary? Who better than him to deal with the issue in regards to the youth? And I know he's going to speak to your question, sister. We have to learn who we need to use to get this job done. Thank you. I just want to, I want to just touch on uh, her question. She asked, how could we get more young people uh, involved in our communities? And you know, young people from urban communities that you know aren't more so involved in, you know, trying to change what's going on as far as like the system. Uh, the way we work with young people, first of all, we, we go into the jails and we work with young people while they're in jail and we do our poetry workshops. And that's just a way of letting young people express themselves and we get to know young people. And I think in any system, if you don't get to know the person that you're helping or working with, you gonna have a problem. And you know, that's the school system, that's the prison system. And that's what's going on as far as the school system. A lot of young people, they're going to school, they don't know their teacher, their classrooms are overcrowded, and their teacher don't really have time. The teacher might want to get to know them, but a teacher had 32, 33 students, it's hard to get to know just one person when she got to work with the whole class. And so in our, the way we touch with young people that are coming out of the system, we, we offer them jobs. We, have to, we, we, we help train them and we tell them about the system and how it's structured so that they know that our, you can get locked up, you get adult felonies, you can get adult time. You can, well, there's no such thing as adult time, but you can get locked up and charged as an adult. You know? And then I tell young people about my experience with being locked up and charged as an adult. And they want to learn that, and they want to hear about that. And you know, just young people hearing from other young people, and me talking in a language that I know that they can connect with, that helps young people really want to get involved and really want to change these things. And I just tell young people the truth. The facts are, the proof is in the pudding. If you look at how much they spend per, per student per year in a, in, a, in a Philadelphia public school versus a Philadelphia suburban public school, it's crazy. It's like. If you just tell them the facts about how the structural violence and how the system is designed, that's enough to make a young person say, no, this is not right, and I don't want them to you know, keep disrespecting me and keep trying to hold me down. You know what I mean? Like, a, a lot of young people, they don't know what's going on in the community, so that's why they don't get involved in their communities. And we have to be the ones to tell pe these young people what's going on. And you know, so, so we go in, we do workshops about structural violence, the school to prison pipeline, and then we talk about our experience with being charged as adults. And I mean, for somebody, just a regular person, a person like you, you might, I don't know what your experience is and if you've ever been through the system, but if you haven't been in the system, all you gotta do is tell them the facts about, 
you know, what's going on with the system. They're spending $685 million to build new prisons, but they cut $550 million from basic education. That's outrageous. Mm -hmm. And then you can just talk about how much they spend per year per public school. I mean, all it, all you got to do is do research and just tell these young people on their own, on your own, like you got to talk on their level, or you got to get young people to talk to young people. Peer to peer mentoring always works. And just to speak on how we need to get more involved in our communities, there's a big disconnect between young people and older people. And it wasn't like that, you know, way back in the day. And that's the problem, you know what I mean? So we all need to get together. We need to talk to each other. We need to see what's going on. You know, like a lot of people, they watch the news and they, they let the media, you know, guide them to another place and stuff. And then they start discriminating against their own people. Mm -hmm. They start thinking, well, damn, uh, it looked like, I think he's, he, he probably did do that. Or he, he's just like the same guy seen on the news, the same reckless young person, you know what I mean? Every young person is not like that. You know what I mean? And honestly, a lot of young people, they have respect for older people that have respect for them and the people that connect with them. You know what I mean? Just like in your neighborhood, when some, when you see an older person in your neighborhood and you doing something wrong, you know not to do it in front of that person because you have respect for that person. Oh, that woman's son, so don't do that. She's right there. She, you know what I mean? Like young people actually do that. I've seen it done. And uh, I just stay in tune with my community. And I work with young people in my community and I work with young people all over. You know, we all had to come together as one and we had to work with each other. Because we're not working with each other anymore. And that's the problem. You know, it's a, big, it's a big disconnect. We keep looking at the news. We keep letting them brainwash us. <laughs> I got you. They, we keep letting them brainwash us. We keep letting the media brainwash us and think that everybody's bad. And that's not the truth. You know, people do desperate things in desperate situations. So we have to make the state create better situations for our community. Thanks. Um, to answer your question, I definitely agree with Josh. I believe that education is very important and I don't believe that the system takes it to be important. Um, and that shows through their actions. I mean, cutting money from the education system to fund the uh, prison system. And, you know, being incarcerated, I realized that, you know, they really don't take education system uh, seriously because when I was, you know, going to school on uh, where I was being held, it was like, you know, it, there wasn't really any structure. Everyone was grouped in the same room. It didn't matter what age or what grade you were. And you got a worksheet that was for a, a second grader or first grader. You had to work on nouns or simple things. You weren't being challenged. You weren't being educated. And I think that that's how the system uh, managed to keep you underground is to not educate you and not give you the tools you need to, you know, fight for yourself and advocate for yourself and advocate for your people. But to um, answer your question about, you know, how to get middle school kids engaged, I didn't learn about the school to prison pipeline until my freshman year. How I learned about it was through my teachers. And it's sad because I was inv I'm involved in the school to prison pipeline and I didn't know what was going on, going on around me. I didn't know it was wrong, what was happening to me because this is, you know, how I lived my life. This is the norm to us. We, we didn't know anything. And I really appreciate my freshman teachers. I think that, you know, they're the best mentors and not only will, had they, they've been my mentors and they will continue to be my mentors for the rest of my life. But the reason I say this is because, you know, they found ways to engage me um, and I never knew the power of activism. I never knew the power of my own voice. I never knew the power of my people. I never knew certain things in education. You know, like my, my English teacher, my history teacher is like, um, they would incorporate certain things into their curriculum about my community. Like they would take half of their class and have people come in and speak to us about what's going on with our community. I know Josh came to my school my freshman year and um, he talked about the system and what was going on and, and, and talked about the prison, uh, school to prison pipeline. And I think that's very important. They pushed me, they pushed me to advocate for myself. When I, they pushed me to see what was wrong within my community. And I think that's very important. You know, Josh said, you speak to them in a language they understand. And I think, that, I think that's very important. You have to show them, not only tell them. So it depends on how much you want to sacrifice your life and how much you want to put into pushing them to understand the system. Because I know my teacher they said, you know, activism is very important. They said, you know, this is what you have to do. This is wrong. This is wrong. Not only did they say that, but I saw them on the front page of the newspaper, either the next speaker, I saw them online, or I saw them at rallies, or, you know, putting their jobs on the line, putting their life on the line. They were out there because they cared. And to me, that pushed me to want to care. 
They didn't look like me skin wise, but that didn't matter. It was that we were fighting for the same cause and that pushed me. And I really felt like they cared about me. So I think, you know, education is very important. Educate your students and meet them where you need to meet them and how you need to, and how, educate them how you need to educate them about the community, whether it's getting them to listen to a rap about the system or, you know, write, write poetry about the system or, you know, just, Find some ways to make you know education about their system interactive and get them to go out and do things, whether it's through community service or having organizations like you know Decarcerate PA or YASP or other organizations around the city to come in and educate them. Have create these partnerships. You know, they were talking, Josh said, you know, there's a gap between adults and youth, but there's also a gap between youth and youth. Like, you know, as we get older, it's like, you know, I'm not messing with you. It's, it's, it's definitely a gap. So I think we need to work together. Um, and also about the organizations, um, okay, about the, <laughs> about the organizations working together, I think it's very important. Like, everyone here, um, I guess, was focusing on, you know, incarceration um, from, the, from, the, from me hearing it. And I think that it's also good to partner up with other organizations in your community that have nothing to do with exactly what you're working with because one way or another, you are connected. We must work together, we must be united. So I think uniting with other organizations organizations that have nothing to do with what you're working on. You know, show, show support and you will receive support and we can, you know, move forward and build a great movement together. And yeah, I, very, I, I admire all the work that the panelists are doing. Um, I think, I just want to say a couple of things in closing. Um, somebody talked about race and how that's not been a conversation that's ever been fully had out in America, fully dealt with, and I think that's true, and that's really important. And race, I think that through mass incarceration, and race is the number one civil rights issue of our time, we need to be serious about looking at this. And I also think it's directly tied to the economics, because I think, I look at tracing it back to slavery, slavery, after that, you know, the amazing rebellions that happened over through slavery, we have this incredible uh, opportunity during Reconstruction 
that couldn't quite answer the problem because source resources were not redistributed to those communities that needed it. It started to happen a little bit, a little bit, and then you know white supremacy came back, crammed KKK, pulled the resources out. You get a new form of racial oppression. You get convict leasing and you get the Jim Crow. Um, you, it's again a system you think, how could we ever defeat this? And yet you do, a movement arises People, ordinary people come together with those most oppressed at the forefront of it, organizing it, they are able to defeat Jim Crow. And yet again, the system did not pour the amount of resources, the resources weren't taken in order to raise those communities up. And so we have a new system that has developed. We have a new system of mass incarceration that has been targeted in ghetto communities, largely communities of color, where jobs due to global capitalism have gone to non-union states, overseas for cheaper labor, and suddenly we have a huge jobless population that was just, you know, out on the streets basically burning down half of America for their civil rights. What, you know, it's not crazy that a new system would come and, and, and be placed upon that. And I think that any solution we need to think about, we need to talk about race, and we need to talk about racial justice, and we need to talk about a serious redistribution of wealth into those communities. But that means for all of our communities, you know, the 99%, this Occupy movement is so inspiring to me because it does bring class politics back into the conversation in America. And not all white people are benefiting from racism and from this horrible system. There is an elite minority, largely white males, yes, that are, that are making billions off of this system, and criminal justice is, is a part of that. And I think we need to fight that. I think we need more movements like Occupy, but more that can get average working people involved. You know, part of the problem is not everyone can go and camp out, not everyone can go to events during the day, they're working. How do we pull in new people? And I think if from this event, we can just get a handful of people that weren't active, active, that's how movements start. That's they right. start very small. They start through education, and if you know, not everyone's going to be in that uh, tribunal Monday, not everyone's going to be in that courtroom at the end of the day, but if we can get a few of you, I think that is how we start to build movements. So I'm very interested in continuing this conversation. I want to remind somebody to send me a note. Sign up on the Broken on All Sides email list and write your organization down so we can all stay in touch. And once again, thank you to all the co-sponsoring organizations and thank you to this amazing panel for all the work that you're all doing. Do you want to say one last thing? <laughs> You know, he kept talking about decarcerate, and he kept saying, you know, let the people out, let the people out, decarcerate the people. But what I think is also so, is so important that Josh and I have been talking about, actually the whole panel has been talking about, is education, decarceration of the mind. You know, educate yourself so you won't be, you know, locked up and, and imprisoned. You know, educate other people so they won't be locked up and imprisoned. You, decarceration of the mind, education is very important. So I believe educate yourselves and continue to educate others on what's going on.